And Father, we do thank you for your word, uh, Lord, because without it, uh, we would, well, we'd be lost, and we would, um, we would not know of your goodness, um, and uh, Lord, <laughs> we just thank you for it, and uh, Lord, thank you um, again, God, that we get to um, uh, continue to worship you uh, by allowing your word to speak to us and get in us, and uh, Lord, if there are things that our mind needs to change about today uh, concerning you and uh, who you are, uh, we just pray that uh, you would do that, and uh, may we not be um, obstinate against your word, uh, but allow it to uh, uh, change our minds, and uh, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Romans uh, chapter 5. And we have slowed down, and we're gonna we're gonna stay a, a little slower through this section because I want to be sure that we uh, really appreciate um, what Paul is saying here and uh, the uh, blessings that he is uh, making those that he's heard of in Rome because um, they are for us as well, and so. Um, so we're not gonna we're not gonna rush through this section, but we're gonna chew on this and see, you know, what it is uh, that we have. And I do have a couple hand handouts. Um, it seemed so. Uh, one you'll see has Grace Baptist on it. It's Romans five. Those are your questions. On the back, there's just a space for notes. And again, uh, the second handout that says Levitical uh, priesthood uh, and. Um, the Melchizedekian priesthood, um, that is for later. You'll, we'll come across these slides later. And then on the back, this is just kind of a little extra thing for you guys. Um, it wasn't just to fill paper, but um, on your, maybe on your own, or just take a look at this. Um, uh, it's a good way to, uh, to, to help you in your sharing of the gospel to others, just to keep the focus on the main thing, and the main thing is who? Jesus Christ, that's right. So, so real quick, uh, I'm going to try and get through this real quick, our visual outline. We are in uh, Romans 5, and as you can see, when we get through here with our justification, we're going to start talking about just, uh, sanctification in uh, uh, chapter 6. Um, justification is what happens uh, the moment one trusts in Christ for their salvation, and at that moment you are declared righteous, okay? Um, and uh, so also this is all a part of the doctrine of salvation, which we've been going to in depth on Tuesday nights. Again, if anybody would like that study, it is recorded uh, through uh, Sugarland Bible Church. Uh, just let me know and I'll gladly send it out to you, or let my wife know, and I can, I can send it out to you. Um, I can send that link out to you. Um, and then also, uh, we, so we've been learning about justification, the imputation of God's righteousness. And uh, where we stopped uh, last week, or where we started last week, was the benefits, we're looking at the benefits now of justification. So Paul, having given the description uh, of justification, the defense of justification by faith alone, and the proof of justification by faith from the law, apart from the law. Uh, in chapter four, we're now looking at, having settled the matter, we're now looking at the benefits of justification. Uh, so, uh, last week, our supporting idea, we, we used this from Kenneth Boa, and it's just a good general uh, a statement, uh, but it, it says, you know, what is Romans 5 about? It's about access to God, hope in the future, knowing the love of God, being saved from the wrath of God, all this and more are benefits of, of finding peace with God. And I've found about 12 uh, in here that we'll take a look at. So uh, today we're on number two. Um, you know, last week we, we looked at this word uh, just simply, you know, uh, therefore, and so uh, we, we said, and we made the statement that unless we believe the facts of justification as stated previously by Paul, or should I say the authority of God's word, the remainder of the book of Romans will be misobserved, misinterpreted, and misapplied. 
And I would dare add that the rest of what the Bible has to say about our justification and our sanctification and spiritual growth will be misunderstood. Okay, this is a significant you know, what section that we've gone through uh, pertaining to just, justification. It, it, it sparked the whole Reformation. Okay, that's, that was its significance because it was Martin Luther, you know, that, that read this and, and caused him to put up his uh, theses on the, st- on, the, on the Catholic Church there, and that's what got him excommunicated. But, uh, but you know, and, uh, and the Reformers, keep in mind, you know, they spent most of their time just battling this one thing, and they never intended to leave the Catholic Church. So, you know, I'm, we're thankful, you know, again, God used the Reformers in that way. And But uh, we should always, again, we should always allow the Word of God to transform and change our thinking and to continually conform into the image of Christ and allow, allow God's Word to change us. So, so this isn't, you know, it's, it's ongoing for us. That's spiritual growth. That's our sanctification. And so the authority then of God's Word has settled the matter of justification uh, by faith. So we read this uh, quote by uh, Tom uh, Constable, uh, Dr. Thomas Constable, and it says, uh, therefore signals that what follows rests on what has preceded. Uh, so in other words, again, you can't move forward until we've, we've got that established. So uh, Paul now put the question of whether justification is by faith or by works behind him. He had proved that it comes to us by faith apart from works. And remember, his uh, argument was Ab- Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that was the whole basis of his argument from the Old Testament. So therefore, having been justified by faith, uh, and so we looked at this, at, this, at this quote, and he says, um, um, you know, we must, kn- we must note at once that the Greek form of this verb declared righteous or justified is not the present participle uh, being declared righteous, but rather the aorist participle, and I know this is a little bit of Greek, um, uh, but some of the English rules uh, do apply, but having been declared righteous or justified, you say, what is the difference? The answer is being declared righteous looks to a state you are in. Having been declared righteous looks back to a fact that happened. Being in a justified state, of course, is incorrect, confusing as it does justification and sanctification. Whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. The moment you believed, God declared you righteous, never to change his mind. Keep in mind, this is a, all this language is, is legal language. And this is, this is taken place in the court of heaven, okay? And God, again, the moment someone trust in the son and God's son for salvation justified it's it's a legal matter it's done that's in the past okay so that's why we say past tense justification and that's why we say you know while we look at salvation past present and future I have been saved and sanctification has to do then with our you know our um, how we learn these truths of God and how we begin to trust them and how we begin to face faith rest in them excuse me faith rest in them and then through that as we yield to the spirit then uh, having trusted God not only for to be justified but also you know not just to save us from hell but also to save us from the lasting effects of sin because we still have stuff you know we still have a sin nature in us and so we can say I am saved I'm being saved if, you know, again, and that's a conditional, the, the sanctification is, but we, we all will be saved, we all will be glorified. And so um, the middle tense really has to do with how we, you know, trust and uh, faith rest in the Lord. And we'll get into that uh, uh, in chapter six. So of course, uh, as David says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not reckon or impute sin. And we read that in four eight. So. Main point last week, we have, and let me make a correction, this is present tense, I said that last week, but let me, we'll we'll get there, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have 
peace with God. It is not a, it's not a subjectional truth. This has nothing to do the moment we trusted in Christ. Relationally, we were restored. Uh, we were reconciled to God. And we were born again. And we became children of God. And so we were then, um, uh, we now have eternal peace with God. And we have in the present, so again, it's in present tense, peace with God. And so, you know, it's not based off of our feelings and, and those sorts of things. The reality is, uh, according to God's word, uh, you know, we have, we hold, we own, we possess peace with God. And so that was, that was last week's. Now, this is the correction because I think I put it, um, I, I put the wrong slide in. So that I was a little I was a little confused last week when I read this. So it's actually, it's present tense, not perfect tense in this case. And this is why it's so significant, okay? Because Romans chapter 5, just real quick, look at Romans 5, uh, 1 through 2. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access uh, uh, by faith into this grace in which we stand. So, just in two verses, Paul says, we have, we have, but they are in different, they're, they're present, but the, um, what we'll look at today is in the perfect tense. And so again, this is established, uh, and it doesn't really t- change much. I just want to make that uh, a correction there, uh, because the present tense verb describes an action performed in the present by the subject. Again, so, uh, so this is you know, God, um, this is all through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, the subject, performed uh, this action, and that's why we have present in the present uh, peace with God. So we looked at the indicative mood again, um, and this, again, is just um, that, that uh, verb we have is in the indicative mood, which expresses expresses an action being performed as a statement of fact. Again, it's just, it's biblical truth. You know, God spoke it. That's it, period. And just as he spoke the world into existence, when he, when he declares the believers justified, they are just, in fact, justified, and they have peace with God. So, and we said uh, we looked at the distinction and made distinction between the peace, peace with God and peace of God. Not to get those two confused. Peace with God happens at justification. It's a past matter. It's a done deal. But peace of God has to do with your sanctification. It has to do uh, with your spiritual growth. It has to do with experience. It has to do, again, with, uh, you know, simply, um, I say simply, but, uh, you know, the battle is, laboring to enter into that rest to where we just, you know, <sighs> set down and trust God at his word. And we're not wiggling and doing all sorts of stuff. You know, we're not getting the wiggles out. We're, we're just simply, we're, we're trusting that no matter what happens, no matter how the waves of the sea are blowing, you know, we're just, we're, we're focused on the promise of God's word and we're, we're faith resting in him. So that has to do with the peace of God. And, and Philippians gives us a charge here. This is, a, this is actually you know, an imperative. He says, be anxious for nothing. It's a, it's a, it's a command, you know, not, not a legalistic command, but it's for your benefit. Again, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, what? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known to God. You see, it's, it all has to do with you. You can not let your requests be made known to God. And what's going to happen, do you think? What's going to result in that? Well, most likely you're going to start to become anxious. Um, you know, um, and, and then you're not going to experience the peace of God. Because you know, this is a condition here. You know, if we don't do this, then we won't experience the peace of God in this present life. Uh, and, but see, this peace, again, God's peace, surpasses all understanding. It makes no sense. And it will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So that was, that was uh, uh, pretty much last week. And, and, and it, we'll end with this quote. It says, again, um, this is H.A. Uh, uh, Ironside. And he says, This peace with God remains unchanged. 
So looking back at peace with God. For it rests not on me, not on my frames of mind or experiences, but on the finished work of Christ and the testimony of the word of God, of which it is written, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So how long is that word settled for? Forever. Okay? So this speaks to our assurance of salvation as well as to our eternal security in Christ. So let's jump back in and we'll start, uh, we'll take a look at the benefits of justification. Um, so we'll read through this. If you like to, if you want to, stand up um, just to honor um, in honor of God's word here. And uh, we'll just read this brief section and then we'll dive in. All right. So, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You may be seated. All right, so. First blessing we have peace with God. And then the second blessing that Paul um, states here uh, is that uh, we have access by faith. And access is into uh, grace, it says. So what does it mean then that we have access? Again, we just made the distinction, you know, the first we have um, is in the present, and this is in a perfect tense. So, a few questions we're going to answer today, and if you look at your sheets, um, it will be, what does it mean that we have access? That should be number, uh, number one, I believe. And uh, when did we obtain access, this access? How do we have access? Who made this access possible? And uh, what is it, you know, what is it exactly that we have access to? So, um, before we uh, jump ahead, question, question two says, uh, and by the way, question one was just simply access, faith, and grace. Uh, I'll try and go through these. Uh, and, and last week, um, uh, I had up there as well, um, did anybody have trouble with that one last week? I think I put up a, hold on one second, somebody had a question about that last week. So all it was is the definition of, of, of have is to hold, own, or possess, and I think I, I might have went through that one a little fast last week, sorry about that. Okay, so we have then is in the perfect tense it's the active voice and it's indicative mood and remember that the meaning of the greek perfect indicative verb is a one-time completed action again performed in the past and has no need uh, uh, to be repeated um, and it has uh, with it excuse me um, it has with it uh, ongoing effects. Uh, so the action was completed in the past, it was perfect, but resulting from that completed action, it, the effects of it continue on into the future. And so, so again, this is, this is the perfect indicative uh, verb here that we have. Again, we have access. There was an action that gave us access, and that action was perfect, and it goes on into the future. So what does it mean? We have access, we have the right to enter into the very presence of a person of high position. That's simply what it means, uh, uh, the fact that we have access means 
that we have the right to enter into the presence of a person of high position. Therefore, this access by faith into God's grace that we have is an ongoing effect of Christ's completed salvific work for the remission of sin. You see, when Christ completed the work and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, we have access. And we'll talk about this later. But before we get there, um, you know, when did we obtain access? When did we obtain access? And uh, we'll keep that in the back of your mind because we're going we're gonna to come back to that because what we want to look at first and what we want to observe is what access kind of looked like in the Old Testament and then, you know, how it compares to, and this is where your, that sheet is going to, we're going to look at that in a little bit. Uh, but first, let's take a look at and let's observe what was required for access in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law. And so this is, this is significant because we are no longer under the Mosaic Law. Uh, there are still portions of it that God will fulfill on His side. There are still promises that God will fulfill on His side but uh, we are no longer under the Mosaic, and we were never under, and let me correct myself, as Gentiles, we were never under uh, the Mosaic Law. You see, Gentiles never had access, again, to the mercy seat uh, to make atonement for sin. Um, again, only Israel had this access. And why is that? Well, because God's covenant was exclusive to the elect nation of Israel. And furthermore, according to the commandment under the Mosaic law, only Israel could produce a priest who could make atonement for sin. Uh, access to the mercy seat was exclusive to the physical descendants of Aaron who were of the tribe of Levi which is why it is called the Levitical priesthood. You see, according to the commandment of the law, no Israelite from any of the other 11 tribes were accepted, you know, and capable of performing this priestly act and entering into the priesthood. Only descendants of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. So, what was required of the Levitical priest to access God's grace under the law? And if you want to read this later, uh, just to get the full gravity of it, it's, I'm going to be just looking over Leviticus, Leviticus 16. So before God's Shekinah glory left the temple, the high priest of Israel was required on the Day of Atonement to perform elaborate rituals to atone for the sins of the people. And the gravity of this occasion was emphasized by God instructing uh, Moses to caution Aaron against entering the most holy place at will. Leviticus 16.2 tells us, And the Lord said to Mo Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. You see, access even then was limited to, as we'll see, once a year. And the following 32 verses of Levit Leviticus 16, so the rest of Leviticus, gives exacting details of the formal procedure that had to be performed to make a yearly a yearly atonement for sin. Verses 3 through 10 provide detailed instructions for the high priest to gain access to the tabernacle, just into the tabernacle. And then verses 11 through 14 give uh, detailed instructions for the high priest to gain access inside the veil, first to make atonement for himself and his household. That's not even, he hasn't even made atonement for the sins of Israel, but first he had to go in and make atonement for himself and for his household. And then verses 15 through 19 provide the detailed instructions for the high priest to gain 
uh, or to um, uh, make atonement then for the assembly of Israel uh, inside the veil. You know, having access now inside the veil, now he can, and having atoned for himself and for his family, now he can make atonement for Israel. Um, and again, this, this is a very, you know, 16 gives uh, a lot of detail there. But the remaining 15 verses give further instructions than to complete the atonement offering. And so under the Mosaic Covenant, access to the mercy seat was limited to the high priest alone once a year and required detailed uh, rituals, lest he die. If a single detail were overlooked, the priest would be struck dead. And so, you know, woven into... um, uh, uh, their robe at the at they had uh, bells on their tassels, and tradition. What we hear from tradition and read from extra biblical is that that they actually tied a rope around the leg of the priest, and uh, when they went in, you know, if the bells weren't ringing, you know, uh, well the angels didn't get their wings, but the priest was, you know, assumed dead, and so they'd use that rope. To pull his body out because they couldn't go in or they would die you know because of uh, God uh, you know being his presence the Shekinah glory being uh, over the mercy seat so that's what access looked like okay this was specific to Israel this is under the Mosaic law so if we want to try and put ourselves under that law guess what we've got to do all this this is what's required this is what's required, but this was not, this was, again, um, exclusive only to Israel. So how do we have access, then, into this grace? So turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews 7, and I don't have this on a slide because we're going to read a chunk of, uh, of uh, scripture here. Hebrews 7, and we're going to begin in 18. And so while you're turning there, the book of Hebrews explains then in detail the superiority of Jesus Christ's priesthood over, over the Levitical priesthood. In other words, you know, the significance of uh, Christ's priesthood uh, over the Levitical priesthood. It, it gives us a superiority of God's oath to his law and the superiority of the new covenant um, to, the, to the Mosaic covenant. And so, by the way, if you want to know more about Jesus' present role as high priest, I encourage you to read the book of Hebrews. So if you want to know his current position uh, and how all this works together, you know, uh, read the book of Hebrews. So starting in verse 18 of chapter 7, it says, Um, you know, the author uh, writes, he says, for on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Why? For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we, this is all believers, draw near to God. Now, it is true that Hebrews is a very, um, you know, it, it, it was written, you know, at the time where primarily the believers here were Jewish. So they would, they would get this, okay? When they read the book of Hebrews, this would jump off the page, you know, and what the, what the Spirit is speaking and inspiring these, you know, th- this is, I'm not saying this, but, you know, it's, it's, it says the law uh, was weak and unprofitable because uh, it made nothing perfect, you know. And inasmuch as he was not made priest with an oath, uh, again, and inasmuch as he was not made priest, with, or excuse me, without an oath, uh, speaking of Jesus, um, for, uh, for they, or excuse me, for they, uh, which is uh, Levitical priest, have become priests without an oath. In other words, Christ Jesus became priest because of the oath of God. 
but, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, period. This is the oath of God Almighty to the Son. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing what we just talked about. But he, Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God, how? Through him. This is our access. This is why we pray 1 John 1, 9. It is through Christ Jesus our Lord we have access. Since he, watch this. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Wow. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, or uh, innocent, uh, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did, how many times? Once, and for who? For all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness. But the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Amen. And so I'm giving you this reference because I couldn't fit this and, and give credit enough, but the, the, what you have on your paper, it's also on there. And so the next two slides, uh, what we're going to read through and take a look at, I got from uh, Stephen Gare. He just uh, met with us two weeks ago Friday in our Friday morning pastors um, uh, class. And uh, he's a, a messianic uh, uh, brother. He's a mess messianic Jew, and um, and so this is his uh, his ministry is Beth Sar Shalom, uh, and he has a really wonderful study uh, on on YouTube there in in the book of uh, Hebrews, and if you ever get the opportunity, it's it's definitely one worth uh, watching um, if you wanna if you wanna kind of begin to you know uh, wrap your uh, understanding around Hebrews. So, so let's take a look at this real quick, quick. We'll try and read through it real quick. And basically it's a, um, we're looking at compar comparing and contrasting or making the distinction between Le the Levitical priesthood. Remember, who was it? Who was the tribe? Levi. And who did you have to be a physical descendant of? Aaron, right, okay. So these are the distinctions between the two priesthoods. So in the Levitical priesthood, it only serves uh, as priests. So you were only a priest. But according to the uh, Melchizedekian priesthood, they served as priest and king. And remember, this is the eternal order. Um, without beginning, without end. And the Levitical priesthood, the ministry is limited to Israel. Uh, and the Melchizedekian is unlimited in scope. And it's available to all. That, that priest is available to all. So, in the Levitical priesthood, they were subordinate to Abraham. Uh, the priesthood was subordinate to Abraham. And the Melchizedekian is superior then to Abraham. So Israel in the Old Testament, they tithed to Levi, and, but according to the Melchizedekian, Levi tied to Melchizedek. In other words, the earthly priestly 
was who the, their offering was given to, their tithe was given to. And in uh, the, the Melchizedekian, uh, the offering is given to um, a Melchizedek himself. So that's not this study, but, but uh, store that somewhere. We'll come back to that at some point. So dependent on Aaron, on Aaronic uh, genealogy and independent of any genealogy. This was appointed by the law. Again, this was appointed by divine oath. As we just saw, the superiority of God's oath and his, his, his swearing um, you know, that he would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek is superior than the earthly law. Because keep in mind, this is all earthly. This is all now heavenly. Because these are a shadow of these things. And that's why you know, the law was given to man to keep but this was given by God then to his son. The oath was given by God to his son. So this required many appointed men, plural, and this requires one appointed son. There's a temporary and limited, uh, it's, it's temporary and limited by mortality. In other words, you know, whether they died from not following um, you know, the, the uh, protocol or the, the ritual properly or uh, just from frailty of age, uh, whatever, there were always, you know, a new priest. So imagine yourself having to get to know a new priest and it's like, okay, wait, did you get all that? Do you know my family? You know, that sort of thing. But, you know, there's, um, when they made atonement again, you know, these things had to be uh, uh, clear. But the priests were always, you know, there were always uh, uh you know, backup priests, but uh, we have um, unlimited by time and duration through immortality, Jesus Christ as our high priest. And so this, under this, because of it, the earthly, the priest needs atonement. But we know that our high priest, he's the very source of atonement because he was sinless. And so priests has restricted access to the Holy of Holies under the Levit Levitical priesthood. But according to the Melchizedekian priesthood, the priest has continual access to the holiest of holies. Again, remember, this was earthly. Even though it was the Shekinah glory, it wasn't in the presence of God. It was something that was, you know, made. Even the ark itself and, and you know, all these things were, you know, uh, borrowed material and and they were created by man now this <laughs> is again in heaven and this is uh the holiest of holies where god permanently uh you know dwells so priest serves in a copy of the divine tabernacle again a shadow and priest serves in the divine tabernacle so priest is chief officiate on the day of atonement atonement and according to the Melchizedekian, priest is fulfillment. Did you catch that? He's the chief officiate, and then uh, Jesus is the fulfillment of the day of atonement. Again, there's no need now for a day of atoning. The priest sacrifices animals. The priest sacrifices himself. Priest regularly offers a series of multiple sacrifices. Priest offers one ultimate sacrifice. Uh, there's continual standing in this. Uh, there was always the work was never done. And here again, Christ Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. You see, there were no, there were no chairs in the temple. Because again, because the priestly work for atoning for sins was never completed. But now, again, Christ is seated at the right hand of God uh, as the great high priest according to the order of Melchizedek because the priestly role uh, for making atonement is completed. Now he lives, he lives to intercede for us, it says. So in this, there was no final remission of sin. It was only a covering, and it was just basically, basically pushed out. And then here, there was a final remission of sin. And sorry about that, the imperfect salvation, uh, you know, uh, is what results from the Levitical, but perfect salvation results from the Melchizedekian. So... All that to say the superiority of God's oath is why the Spirit of God explains through Paul and Romans the fact that God in his forbearance 
passed over the sins that were previously committed. Again, he says, but now the righteousness of God, and this is a, a little review for us, but it'll help bring us per, into perspective, apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by what? His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, those sins were just simply passed over. It never, it was never perfect. It never, it just covered. It was just an imperfect atoning until, and, and, and again, in his forbearance, he passed over those so that in the present, you know, at this time when Christ was crucified, that God's righteousness might be demonstrated. Again, Here's man demonstrating their, you know, their obedience to following these things, and it's imperfect, and it can only, you know, again, it, it's, hey, look, I'm going to do this work, and it's going to be perfect. I'm going to allow this to, to uh, my, you know, wrath to pass, and I'm going, in my forbearance, I'm going to deal with these, all these sins, and push them out, and push them out, until my son makes the final atonement for this. And then... When Christ Jesus said, it is finished, guess what? It was finished. It was complete. It was done. No more atonement for sin. Do we see the goodness of God? Do we see his goodness? Do we understand this? Do we know that we have access? You see, before Christ's death and resurrection, all the sacrifices that they perform, you know, under the Mosaic Covenant, they were unable to do away with the penalty of sin permanently. And this is what is revealed to us in Hebrews. He says there, he says that, you know, that there's a need for, there was a need for a better covenant, you know, because the Mosaic Covenant was temporal. Again, that's, it was, it was set up and established, you know, with Israel to deal, you know, with the, with the sin uh, at that time until Christ came. And so, uh, so this, that's what is shown to us in Hebrews, that there was a need for a better covenant, and then when the Spirit proclaimed that the law made nothing perfect because the former commandments, uh, weakness and unprofitableness. In other words, it could not achieve what Christ achieved on the cross. So furthermore, since Gentiles were not legal members of the Mosaic Covenant, we could never, we could never have a qualifying priest to make atonement for our sins under the former commandment. So question four, how do we have access? We have access because of the atoning work of our high priest, Jesus Christ. So Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one tells us the very moment Christ yielded up his spirit, it says, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The veil, it was torn in two. The veil that limited access to the mercy seat of God has been torn in two. That's what on the, on the physical, and I, I think that this was also, you know, a, a type of, of um, you know, judgment towards rejecting Israel as well, that, you know, that this happened because this was, you know, again, this was to them, you know, they were still making these sacrifices, and so this was, you know, when God did this and ripped, uh, ripped the veil, um, you know, it was, it was probably pretty, uh, you know, what does this mean? You know, and, uh, and again, it ripped from top to bottom. 
And so, so then, question five should be an obvious answer. Who made this access possible? Again, we have access because of Jesus Christ. So going back to question three, um, you know, when, when did you obtain access into this grace? So first, access was made available again the moment Christ sat down at the right hand of God the Father. So the moment that Christ sat down at the right hand of God the Father, access was made available to those that would trust in Christ. However, you know, you and I, we were gifted access the moment that we had faith in Jesus Christ for yours and or mine and our individual sin. At that very moment, you gained access. You began to have act, perfect access into God's grace. That was the moment that you obtained access into God's grace. So what is it then that we have access to? Again, because of Christ Jesus, we have the right to enter the presence of God's grace. You see, do we realize, do we realize and take advantage of the fact that we have, through our high priest, Jesus Christ, we have unlimited access by faith to God's throne of grace. Are we praying? You know, do we take advantage of this? Do we, do we consider and look at all the things that it took for, for the Levitical priest to gain access? And are we this is why I think it says with all things in all things give thanks. <laughs> you know, like like again, like we should we should be, you know, and here's the thing, folks, like we you know, I, I'm I'm I say we, uh, you know, self included. We I don't think that we if we're honest with ourselves, do we do we take advantage of this? Are we are we bringing our requests to God? Are we accessing, you know, these things in our time of need? Are we are we looking to God for grace in our time of need. And so, again, we have access to grace. And some people say God's riches at Christ's expense. That's an easy one to remember. But I like this one. It's God's great gift. It's God's richest gift. It's God's acceptable gift. It's God's complete gift. And it's God's eternal gift. That's what grace is. It's all a gift. It is unmerited, it is undeserved, but it has been made available, and it is free to anyone, again, that would simply uh, trust in Christ for their individual salvation. As a believer, again, this is where we now have access. This is what we have access to. So when we mess up, again, as we pray in 1 John 1, 9, uh, you know, it says if we, um, well, First, before we get there, the scripture tells us then, again, here's another let us verse. It says, let us therefore come boldly. What's our posture? Boldly. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It speaks to posture. Again, this speaks to my trust and my confident confidence in the completed work that God did. You see, we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, and we can now come to him boldly. Again, you know, we don't have to we don't have to beat ourselves up and we don't have to sit and ponder, you know, how, well, did I did I sin today? I don't know. You know, how many you know, all those things. Again, the Spirit of God will, you know, bring to your remembrance. If there's something that is broken fellowship, you know, rest assured, you know, and, and there are things that are going to be unknown. And this is why, you know, Peter needed his feet washed again 
you know, that, that whole scene when, when uh, Christ was washing um, the, the, the feet of Peter, you know, he said, you, you've already been cleansed. You've already been, you know, we're, we're, we're already uh, atoned for, but in our going, we break fellowship with God and what's needed then, that's why we need First John 1, 9 to come along and say, if we confess our sins, uh, my children, you know, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. No, all unrighteousness. Again, even the things that we might not be privy to or might be made unaware of, again, His grace is that good. It's, it's you know, His, his cleansing is, is, is that perfect. So, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have perfect access by faith into this grace. That's question seven. We have perfect access by faith into this grace. And so keep in mind, what does it say in Romans 1.18 in the latter part of the verse? The just shall live by faith. This is what the picture, and we're starting to see now what this means, how significant and how important faith is in our living as a believer. It's not just, oh, I had faith in God for my salvation, and then I, I've got it from here. No, this is the justified, those who have been justified by God shall live by faith. That's how we live. And you notice it's not, you know, this is apart from the law. This is apart from deed. This is, again, all those things will be transformed when God's word gets in us and begins to search us and know us. And, uh, you know, and we'll take a look at that when we get into uh, uh, second tense sanctification. So um, we're going to start uh, stop there. And I don't if there's anybody, you know, that has any question about this um, and specifically, you know, simply... I think it was, you know, on something like this, it's, it's pretty um, easy to, to walk through this and see the good news that, that God has brought to man uh, through his son and the significance of his death on the cross. You know, so we now have a high priest, again, um, according to the order of Melchizedek, you know, it's an eternal order, and we looked at all those things uh, that are superior to the old uh, order of things uh, under the Mosaic Covenant. And, uh, and what a perfect way, you know, to transition uh, into communion because, you know, this is, this is the point. This is what we remember. We remember the shed blood and we remember the body of Christ for, you know, for atonement as a propitiation for our sin. Um, but remember that he, he was uh, delivered up because of our transgression uh, and he was raised because of our justification. So this is why we celebrate the blood and the body of Christ because we have now a high priest in an eternal glorified body seated next to, he is both God and man, seated next to God the Father and he's interceding for us. He sealed us with His Spirit, who is also interceding for us. And so it would be appropriate for us to intercede, <laughs> to take advantage of this access. This is, not a, this is not a bash. This is not a, you know, again, it's to make us aware of, like, you know, again, we, we underutilize prayer because we get to do these things. We get to bring our brothers and sisters to Christ. We get to pray, you know, for our community. We get to pray for our church. We get to pray for our family. We get to pray for our kids. You know, we get to pray uh, for our nation and then also for the nation of Israel and the state of the world. And of course, you know, this access that we have, you know, it costs. It costs Christ his life. 
he shed his blood and died so that we could have this access. And so that we could go through him now, the great high priest, uh, to God the Father. We no longer have to go through earthly rituals or, or, a, or some uh, imperfect human priest, uh, but we have a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's pray and then we'll, we'll get into um, uh, uh, communion. Father, we do thank you again for um, this opportunity. I thank you again just what it means, uh, Lord, to, um, to be able to bring our, our adoration, Lord, our, our thanksgiving, all, all the things, Lord, our, our supplications, all of our intercessions, our requests, all the things that we get to bring to you, Lord. I, I thank you that we can uh, trust you um, and we can place our, our faith in the fact that uh, if it is according to your will, uh, the answer is yes and amen. And Lord, we know one thing for certain, uh, uh, that your word tells us um, that uh, the will of the Lord for our life is our sanctification. Lord, you want to use us. You want vessels that you can um, um, use and, uh, and bring uh, glory to you. But Lord, it's, it's also uh, not just for our benefit but, and, and to bring glory to you, but for the benefit of others, Lord. And so uh, uh, help us in our, in our growth. Help us, again, continue to give us understanding. And Lord, as we uh, begin to... Um, um, celebrate at the communion table, Lord, uh, as we prayed earlier for, um, uh, for sins and, and things according to 1 John 1, 9. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we trust that uh, everything is established there, but Lord, um, we do uh, want to look to your word uh, here again in a minute and see uh, this manner that we uh, do uh, appreciate and um, uh, give thanks in, Lord, uh, for, your, uh, for your son uh, who shed his blood and uh, offered his body uh, for atonement for us and um, and thank you for um, just the proof of our justification uh, from raising Christ from the dead and the hope and the promise of uh, a body uh, uh, in, in glory for us as well that we get to enjoy eternity in a new body uh, that is not of dust but um, it's a building that you've made and so thank you uh, for this, and uh, may you be glorified uh, in our uh, celebration of communion. In Jesus' name, amen.